Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's Better Managers Briefing. I'm Anne Franca, the Chief Executive of the Chartered Management Institute, and every Friday at this time, we try to bring you news in the management and leadership sphere that you can use to help navigate these difficult times. So today, I'm delighted to welcome two companions. The first is Lieutenant General Richard Nuji, who is the Climate Change and Sustainability Strategy Lead at the Ministry of Defense. And secondly, Dr. Hayatun Silim, CBE, who is the Chief Executive of the Royal Academy of Engineering. Welcome to you both. And today's topic is one that I know that everybody cares about. It's about how to build a sustainable society, a more sustainable society, one that really can address climate change coming out of this crisis. Now, um, my first question is about uh, the impact of the crisis on climate, because one of the silver linings of this crisis has been that we have seen a, a drop in greenhouse gas emissions by up to 25% during lockdown. Yet it has been devastating as well for the economy. And as we emerge from this crisis, can we both rebuild and renew growth and have a greener economy? at the same time? Or do you think that those notions are contradictory? Um, do you agree with those that say a green reco recovery is completely and uh, utterly possible? So let's start with your views on that. Maybe I'll start with you, Hayatim. Thank you very much. Well, the only effective and meaningful economic recovery is a green recovery. And I think it would be a massive, a, a calamitous mistake to not integrate our sustainability ambitions into our plans uh, to improve our economic performance. You know, we've seen so many things in this pandemic. Um, you know, there's been so much suffering. We have to extract all the learning we can. So we've seen, for example, the huge significance of what it really means to be resilient. And you're not going to achieve any kind of resilience, economic or otherwise, unless you consider what the climate impacts are likely to be. We've seen what it feels like to experience absolutely seismic disruption to almost every aspect, aspect of our lives. Well, the potential for climate disruption is even worse than that we've already experienced through the pandemic. And we've also seen that when the imperative is strong enough, that actually we can do extraordinary things, things that we never believed would be possible. We've seen that um, we can move uh, much faster, we can have much more radical transformation than we perhaps ever gave ourselves credit for in the past if the imperative is strong enough. And so for me, I really hope and believe and will work towards ensuring that we take those lessons forward into our plans for economic recovery so that we raise our ambition about what we can achieve in terms of sustainability and a green recovery and we increase our determination to achieve it. And ultimately, the UK positions itself as a um, an innovator and a driver of climate resilient business, then it's going to help our competitiveness. You know, we're going to be able to create new jobs, new market opportunities, new export opportunities. We're going to be a more attractive destination for inward investment. And we're also going to hopefully be able to make sure that we take into account societal requirements, so the kind of the wider um, engagement with what societal priorities are into our economic recovery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, those are all very important. And Richard, obviously, you're in charge of sustainability and uh, climate change and making this transformation for the MLD. What are your thoughts on how we can drive a green recovery, if indeed we can? Well, I think the, fir the, the, the first thing to say is that um, if we don't, uh, it'll cost us far, far more later. Um, if we build carbon into any recovery, um, uh, it, it is the law of this land now that uh, we have to hit net zero by 2050. Um, we, we've gone out as a leader in the world, uh, proclaiming and putting it into law that we have to be net zero by 2050. Um, so if we actually build carbon back into our economy um, uh, through a non-green recovery, uh, from this uh, uh, crisis, uh, we're only going to have to take it out later and it's going to be much, much, much more expensive to take it out once you've put it in. So, so there's a complete logic to turning, there's a financial logic which turns around and says that if you start with a green recovery, you don't need to take out um, uh, carbon later. But actually what um, evidence shows and what the Committee on Climate Change, um, who've just produced a report, uh, what their report shows is that um, uh, if you build back green, you create more jobs, um, and you create jobs that are going to be longer lasting in a green environment. 
And so for me, actually, this is about the economy. This is about building the economy in a way that uh, means that we have more jobs, more sustainable jobs, uh, and in new technologies. I'm, I um, uh, am a passionate believer that actually this offers us opportunity. Um, and that, yes, there will be a very difficult time for us. But what green technologies are doing is offering us opportunities that weren't even there five years ago, that didn't even exist five years ago. Um, and that therefore, if we can harness that as a nation, then, as, as Hayatin said, we can actually be world leaders in some of these technologies. We can innovate our way out of this that will give us a better economy, a greener economy, and a bigger economy uh, through, through working through green. And I think there's one example that I would quote, which is South Korea. After the 2008 crash, South Korea decided that what they were going to do was look at battery technology. They're now some of the world leaders in battery technology because they decided to do it first and they decided to go full scale into a green um, uh, economy through battery technology. Um, we have the opportunity to do something very similar with that, with some of the innovations that are coming out of the UK. We're a very innovative uh, nation, um, and, and actually, therefore, harnessing that innovation uh, will be fantastic. And I'm, I'm, I'm sure that um, some of the really difficult numbers are around um, each person's personal house and uh, the heating that is taken up. Uh, mostly through gas, some through oil, um, but actually less than, le le less than we need through electricity at the moment. If we can try and convert that, we can have a massive effect on the greening of our, um, of our nation and of our economy by building in through things like insulation. But that will also bring innovation as we move forward and as people get more and more used to doing it. So I think it's not a question of, is it a good idea? Is it possible? I think the alternative is going to be a lot more expensive and it is going to produce less jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. Well, you mentioned uh, house insulation, but um, I, I wanted to ask what are, what are some of the other big ticket items and ideas um, that will best contribute to this green recovery and how can governments and businesses and investors and other institutions work better together to really drive the nature of the recovery that you you both support. Um, and, and is this an international effort or is this a highly localized effort or is it both? I know that's a big question, but Hayatin, what are your thoughts on that? It's an and, and, and. We're going to need all of the above. Um, this is a massive systems challenge that we're facing here. Um, to achieve net zero, we have to simultaneously transform multiple vital interconnected sectors, industries, infrastructure systems, whether it's transport or housing, as you just referred to, energy manufacturing. We're going to require the development of whole new industries and, and, and allow those to mature. We're going to have to see sweeping changes to um, institutions, behaviours, culture, society at large. I mean, this is this is a, a mega challenge that, that all of us need to get behind. And actually what's going to be incredibly important is taking a systems view of what actually is effective in practice. Because you can end up in a situation where unless you take that systems view, you can make decisions that are very well intentioned, but actually don't help you get closer to your target. Um, so that systems view will help us to get uh, a grip of where the interdependencies are, what the trade-offs are, which incentives we need to max out on, how to how to get the best leverage. Um, the Academy um, has really prioritised sustainability. In fact, we just published a new strategy uh, a couple of months ago for the next five years, and that has as our overarching goal, harnessing the power of engineering to build a sustainable society and an inclusive economy that works for everyone. Mm -hmm. And as one of the flagship pieces of work that we're taking forward currently, we are, uh, we've con convened a group, it's a multidisciplinary group, through our National Engineering Policy Center. And it's trying to take that net, net, sorry, that systems approach to net zero so that we can support policymakers in making good choices now that will help us to get to the destination that we're heading for. COVID has shown us some great um, uh, insights that we, we can carry forward. I, I mentioned some of them earlier, but another one of those would be collaboration. It's been so encouraging to see the extraordinarily wide ranging, quite complex collaborations between the public and the private sector, companies large and small, that kind of collaboration where we're all configuring ourselves around a common goal, something we really recognize the shared importance of, is exactly what we're going to need to deliver on net zero. 
we've seen as well the policymakers and regulators being really innovative and flexible in how they support the private sector in making good decisions that help us move faster towards um, a, a really important shared goal. Again, we're going to need to see more of that. Um, we've also seen really good examples of knowledge sharing between sectors, but also within sectors. And again, that sharing of best practice so that best practice becomes common practice is crucial. And just give one specific example. Um, I'm involved in the Made Smarter Commission. It's the UK's Industry 4.0 initiative. So it's trying to support UK manufacturers in, in um, adopting, driving up their, their um, competence and capabilities around digital technology so that they can improve their competitive edge. And we recently decided to integrate net zero into the objectives of Made Smarter because we recognize that actually, you know, your productivity target, your competitive target, target exactly as Richard was describing, depends on ensuring that you are smart about resource efficiency and productivity, that you consider how your, um, you know, cl climate credentials can boost your competitive edge. Um, manufacturing accounts for 15% of greenhouse gas emissions in the UK, it's a significant chunk. And so integrating net zero into these existing initiatives is the sort of thing we're just gonna have to do loads more of. The, Cl the Commission on Climate Change tells us we're not going fast enough to get to our target of net zero by 2050. And when you think about the timescales for investment, for plant and equipment, the rate at which those turn over, it's really urgent that we start making sure that net zero and sustainability are absolutely front and center in our priorities today in business. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to just catch up at a later stage. So that, that's my starter for 10 on that. I'm sure Richard will have other great thoughts. Yeah, Richard, what are, what are your thoughts on this? So I'm, I, I'm going to be um, uh, uh, a, a little sort of practical from where, for where we're coming from. Um, I think there are two big things that we need to do. One is to change the behavior of people. And COVID has gone a very long way to showing that actually behavior will change. And people have changed their behavior astronomically as a result of, um, of the COVID crisis. Um, uh, partly because uh, they've understood the threat from not doing so, and partly because the government has asked them to politely. Um, uh, and and I, I think it's very interesting that actually we, we have locked down and that the police have actually not arrested many people. In fact, very, very few um, have been charged um, with, with breaking lockdown. So, so this is, um, the government asked us to do it. We have done it without having to resort to um, uh, the, the, the strictures of the law to be able to do so. And I think there's an opportunity here. And, and, and to sort of give an example of what I mean, um, when we have a, a petrol car, um, as I do still, although I'm looking for an electric one, um, uh, when we have an electric, uh, a petrol car, we fill it up when the tank gets empty. Um, but we don't, on the whole, fill up um, the battery on our mobile phone the moment it gets empty. We fill it, we, we, we charge it whenever we're not using it. And, and so we, we're sort of half filling it all the time as opposed to waiting till it empties and then filling it with a great big splurge sort of idea. That's the sort of behavior we need to think about. We need to change our way of thinking in terms of how we use energy, how we can reduce the energy that we're using um, and reduce the demand. And that comes from things like building management systems so that we know what our buildings are actually operating in terms of energy. And we've got an example down on the South Coast as one of our bases, um, who have reduced their energy uh, consumption by 60% uh, by really understanding where that energy is going. So there's, there, there's, there's a piece about behavior there. There's a second piece, and I'll pick up on something Hyatt and said, is it, it's about resilience. Um, we need to be much more resilient ourselves in terms of energy. Um, and that means um, uh, building more wind farms, building more solar farms, uh, building ground source heat pumps. Um, Heat space or space heat, sorry, space heat, which is heating our houses, heating our buildings, is actually one of the biggest contributors uh, to um, uh, the um, emissions that we have in the um, infrastructure space. Um, because actually most of us heat using non-electric means. And what we have to find is a green energy way of doing that. And it's not just insulating, it's actually getting the heat there in the first place. We have to find ways of using the heat from the sun to make sure that we can store that and then uh, uh, use it when we need to, uh, rather than dissipating it at the wrong time. So, so there's sort of two big ideas. One is about behavior. One is about uh, using what we've got and building more. Uh, and it comes back to this innovation piece. Um, 
I'm particularly interested in the concept of microgrids because a lot of our um, uh, a lot of our uh, infrastructure is not actually on the grid at all because it's it's little pieces miles away from anywhere. So we've got to try and create self-sustaining microgrids all over the country of the little bits on our land. That um, w I at the moment it's all gas or it's an oil tank. We can get rid of that by producing sensible electricity and sensible storage. And if we can crack the storage, actually, we've got a really good opportunity to reduce our emissions. Right. Some really great examples there. Um, but, you know, obviously, you're, you've both singled out the need to innovate. Um, we need uh, skills to innovate. Um, uh, now, Hayatin, you're obviously CEO of the Royal Academy of Engineering. You know all too well that we face an acute skills shortage already in engineers. Um, so how are we going to get skills we need to drive all of these innovations and encourage these sustainable solutions? Absolutely. Well, I'm so glad you've asked me about this because it's a huge, huge issue. <laughs> And um, National Grid has estimated that the UK energy sector alone is predicted to need to fill 400,000 roles between now and 2050 in order to reach net zero. And well over half of those will be newly created roles. So they are, we're going to need a skilled workforce for deploying these low carbon um, electricity uh, technologies for home retrofitting, for deploying infrastructure for hydrogen, carbon capture and storage, installing electric vehicle charging infrastructure and so forth. And we don't know what all the jobs are going to be, but we do know for certain that we're going to need more and different technical skills. And as you've referred to already, you know, we have a pre-existing engineering skills shortfall and engineers are going to be absolutely critical to delivering net zero. They have to design, they have to build, they have to retrofit, operate, um, ensure the safety of the infrastructure and technologies that will underpin a decarbonised UK. And we're also going to need lots of that engineering systems thinking that I referred to earlier. So we need to be ensuring that we can meet the numbers, but we also need to be very proactive in integrating sustainability into the way that we are training engineers. So we need to make sure that it, it becomes part of becoming a professional engineer to really understand how to integrate sustainability and how to um, convert aspiration into practical reality within the context of engineering. And actually, I think that applies to pretty much other any other profession too, but obviously my expertise is around engineering. Um, and I would be remiss not to mention the fact that we also have a very, very significant diversity deficit in engineering. So it's a source of much regret to me that we still have a profession that is 12% female and 9% black and minority ethnic engineers. And um, we already before this pandemic were worried about unemployment due to automation of course now we have unemployment due to covid and the consequences of the measures that we're taking to control the pandemic and so we need to be very thoughtful about how we um, look ahead and take measures that will ensure that we don't keep um, increasing inequality and reducing diversity or inclusion we need to do the reverse and I see one big opportunity as being the fact that there is this enormous upskilling and retraining effort. And if we are smart, we can actually use that as a chance to enrich the population of people who then go on to fulfill those future facing roles that underpin net zero. And as I said earlier, you know, I'm determined that we're going to play our part in that. But I would love employers to be thinking about how can they use the fact that they know their skills needs are changing and they are going to have to invest in training. How can they use that as a chance to make sure that we end up with a much more diverse profession and much more di diverse workforce delivering net zero than would be the case if we just carried on as we are now? That's a really great point. We heard yesterday thousands of workers in retail being made redundant. Many of these are women. Those people you're saying should be redirected and redeployed to tackle this kind of um, skills challenge. Richard, do you have anything to add to that before I ask you about electric tanks? <laughs> so I, I would make two points. Um, one uh, is apprenticeships. Um, I think they're going to be an absolutely essential part of what we do, that actually um, practical apprenticeships in this space uh, to build the skills base right from the word go is really important. The other thing I would say is that actually um, 
we, we um, I, I've just been asked to um, build sustainability into what we have as a, a generalship course, uh, which all our generals go on um, when they first become generals. Um, it's not a course on sustainability, but I've been asked to build sustainability into it. Um, I've been asked to um, uh, build sustainability um, uh, into the commanding officer's designate course. Um, uh, again, it's not a co it's a course on how to be a commanding officer and the pitfalls of being a commanding officer. But actually, sustainability should be a part of every course that. Um, we can we, we operate so, because what that will do it'll it'll raise people's awareness that's great but it'll offer people perhaps the opportunity for that spark of an innovational um, idea to come forward and say actually no I've got a really good idea on this and let's use it so I don't think it's enough to do apprenticeships it's not enough to train people in these skills per se I think what we need to do is train uh, the, any any course that you do, pretty much, whether it's a leadership course, uh, whether it's a, a course on um, how to do certain things, um, should have a sustainability element into it. And if we can build that in, then we'll get genuine innovation because people will start to think about it in a much more imaginative way. Mm, that's an excellent point. So don't treat it as a standalone. Make it uh, part of the systems thinking. For it's yeah. part of every skill set, as Hi Autumn was saying. Um, now. On to electric tanks. When I think of the, the aircraft carriers and the fighter jets on the tanks and the, um, you know, of the, the things we traditionally associate with defense, a carbon neutral is not something uh, or green that springs to mind. Um, uh, what are your plans then on, you know, this incredible task of reducing the carbon footprint across the whole of the MOD? What are some of the thoughts you're having? Well, I could talk for hours on this, and um, uh, most people would be bored stupid, so I won't. Um, but, but I think there's, um, there's great opportunity. Um, uh, uh, first thing I would say is that actually um, we're pretty good at some of this already. Um, uh, the biodiversity that we have on Salisbury Plain, for example, is second to none in the south of England uh, because um, uh, it is uh, land that has not been ploughed for 150 years. Um, it's land that has not had people walking over it in any great numbers, um, the odd soldier walks across it um, uh, for 150 years. Um, and, and therefore, it is almost untouched. Um, but it's also, for, for some uh, species, it's really good to be disturbed. Um, and we fire artillery shells into it, which disturbs the land, which is actually really good for these species. Um, and so, so actually, some of our, some of our biodiversity is, is, is really good. Um, but that's not enough. Um, what we need to do is look at uh, um, existing technologies uh, to reduce the carbon footprint of our estate. Um, so we, we can go a very long way to putting LED into all our lighting uh, 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 of our accommodation. Um, uh, we can make it all double glazed and all the rest of it. We can do that. Uh, we can get to ground source heat pumps and air source heat pumps. Um, we can put in our own um, uh, solar panels and so on to run our estate. Um, and our estate is some 30% of our emissions as the Ministry of Defence, and therefore it becomes important. The other thing, and where I'd like to take it, is um, uh, we have peat bogs up in uh, the uh, north of England, which um, have been allowed to degenerate. If we regenerate those, they will become massive carbon sinks uh, rather than um, emitting, which is what they are at the moment. Um, and we have opportunity to plant trees. So there's, there's a whole piece that we can do on our estate. But you're right, aircraft carriers are pretty um, uh, big emitters, um, as are fast jets. Um, and um, as, as my boss keeps on saying to me, we're not going to put solar panels on fast jets because it just won't work. Um, so, and we're not going to have electric tanks uh, because they just won't work. Um, uh, you know, uh, and we can't, we, our purpose is to defend the nation and therefore we can't come second in a war, so to speak. We have to be at the cutting edge of technology and being able to defeat our enemies or the enemies of, uh, of this nation. So, so what we've got to do is look at ways of minimizing that. There are lots of ways we can do that. We can use different fuels. Um, we can use um, uh, different ways of doing it. Uh, so um, uh, we can try and take the person out of the vehicle um, and make it semi-autonomous. And that means it doesn't need quite so much protection because you're not protecting the individual. That means it's lighter. That means you can put a different propulsion system into it. So there's lots of things that we can do. But uh, and I'm, I'm confident we could get to net zero by 2050, but it won't be zero. Um, we will still have some equipment, so our, our aircraft carriers and our fast jets, that are going to emit even in 2050. So we've got to offset that using our estate. 
and but I'm confident we can do that. Okay. Well, before I um, open it up for questions, and if you want to ask a question, please just put it into the link underneath the YouTube um, uh, uh, video that you're watching now. Um, but I wanted to ask each one of you, um, maybe uh, briefly before I open it up, what can we as individuals, as managers and leaders do um, to help accelerate a green recovery? So if there were just like one piece of advice that you wanted to give um, our, our viewers today on how they could help, what would that be? Hi, Atten. Thank you. Um, yes, well, I think we've had a lot of focus in the past few months and years on defining the problem space, and we really need to put our energy into the solution space now. So I would encourage all managers and leaders to really think about what in practice can each of us do to help deliver change. Remember that systems view so that we don't just do things which are symbolically supportive, but actually, you know, help deliver tangible progress and embody that spirit of collaboration that we are going to need to do this really hard thing. And then finally, include sustainability in your personal and organizational definition of success. Great. Thanks. Richard, what's your advice? What can we do? Uh I agree with everything that Hyatt said. I'm going to say something slightly different, which is engage the workforce. Um, uh, get the, the, the most uh, new, the most junior, the most, uh, you know, everybody in the workforce thinking about it. Um, and and um, use vehicles. We, we've just shown a World Wildlife Fund um, with them. We've just shown a film uh, uh, and, and got uh, nearly 400 of our workforce um, uh, just uh, thinking about it. And... As part of that, um, find ways of empowering them to do something about it. It can often seem that it's such a big task that you as an individual can't do anything about it. Um, I'm, I, I, I think there's real opportunity. If you can empower them to do something about it themselves, then you'll have a really powerful engine room of, um, of change in your organization uh, coming from the bottom of people who are passionate about it, who want to make a difference, allow them to do so and empower them and give them the ability to do so. Great. Well, I, for one, will no longer be compulsively charging my phone all the time. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's, no re there, there's no reason not to. That, that, that's the right thing to do. <laughs> oh, it's the right thing to do. Oh, okay. Well, then I'll keep doing that. Right. I'm going to open it up to questions. Our first question is from Mark. Is there a danger the drive for economic recovery in nations will work against aspirations for green economies as shortcuts and relaxations are applied? Is this going to undo progress we've made? So in our effort to drive economic recovery, we forget about sustainability. Hi, Artin, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a risk. And I think both Richard and I spoke at the start that, you know, we felt incredibly short sighted to think that you can achieve sustained economic recovery whilst not paying attention to the, to the climate challenge. And I and I think, you know, that, that, that we've talked about resilience. Resilience is probably one of the words we've heard most during this last few months. Um, but but, you know, if you think about what resilience means, you just can't do that unless you're factoring in sustainability. The other thing I think may help us is that it's been a bit of a wake up call around how, how we prioritise health and well-being of society and the sense of the interconnectedness of the planet and people and planet. And actually, I think that there's going to be a societal pushback if we fail to um, bank that progress in terms of people's you know, awakening almost. So I think, I think that potentially offers us um, a little bit of risk mitigation here, but it would be a horrible, horrible mistake if we were to think there was even such a choice. Richard? Um, I agree. Um, uh, of course, it's a risk. And it's a risk, particularly if the price of oil is very low. Um, I, I mean, it went down to a ridiculous, uh, wonderful um, uh, uh, cartoon of um, uh, uh, showing that um, a barrel of oil was cheaper than uh, the price of a loo roll. Um, you know, um, uh, that that, that actually is a huge threat to um, a green recovery um, because because um, it, you will go for, um, in order to try and build jobs, you'll go for the cheapest solution. And if you go for the cheapest solution and the price of oil is still low, uh, that, that then we're going to uh, reintroduce a, a carbon-based economy uh, in a way that is wholly unhelpful and will have to be undone um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, later, which will cost more. So it's mm -hmm. a risk. 
I, I think that's why um, uh, this government, uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not making a political point, uh, but why a number of governments around the world are trying to make this the opportunity to get to a green recovery. And it's not just this government, it's the French, it's the Canadians, it's the Germans. You know, um, lots and lots of countries are turning around and putting stipulations on the recovery that force it to be green. Um, and there's a very good example with Air France, uh, where Air France could take the loan only if they committed to a greener outcome. And so I think that sort of conditionality is quite likely to happen even in this country. Um, and it's something that we must do in order to make sure that we end up green. Great point. Um, the next question is from Sue. Given that net zero commitments, uh, given the net zero commitments, should there be financial incentives for businesses and individuals to move to electric vehicles and improving building efficiency? So two points there. Um, around incentives of the sort Richard just mentioned. Hayatin, what's your view on that? I think yeah, financial incentives are undoubtedly going to be part of how we get to net zero, but it comes back to the systems view. We've got to look and see, is that the best way of spending the money that we have? There's a limited amount of you know, financial incentives that we can offer. Um, and I don't feel I'm the best place person to comment on whether those two specific ones uh, you know, are the right ones to do at this moment in time. But I think financial incentives will be key for stimulating behaviour change. But also just the government needs to st has send long term signals to promote investment in the private sector. And actually, that's probably going to be as important as anything else. And Richard, do, do you have a view on whether these incentives are a good idea? So I think incentives work. Um, uh, uh, whether, whether the government will do that or not is another matter. But 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 actually, the amount of money, the three billion that um, the chancellor mentioned um, a few days ago, that is that is a financial incentive. Um, you know, the, the financial incentive to get people going back to restaurants, it, it's a financial incentive, and hopefully it'll work. And, and I'll just use my personal example: uh, when the feed-in tariffs were really really good for solar panels, I put some solar panels on my roof, um, and um, the solar panels were expensive, um, uh, but um, um, it was worth it with a seven-year payback for those solar panels. Uh, uh, given I'm in the south of England, that's quite helpful. Um, uh, you know, it, it, incentives work. I would not have done it if it hadn't been for the um, very generous feed-in tariffs uh, that were available at the time. But there are no feed-in tariff incentives anymore, or very, very um, small feed-in tariffs. But the price of um, uh, the uh, solar panels have come down so much that you don't need such a big incentive. So I don't think we should think of, if they do put incentives in, they should be temporary. Uh, they should be to stimulate the economy and stimulate the, um, the industry. And then they can be pulled away to put our money into different incentives and different innovations where we need them. But I think they work. Okay, great. So the last question, and it's a very good one here from Manish. It seemed to me that for many years, too many leaders have paid lip service to environmental standards. Do you think now this is changing? Hi, Artin. I really believe it is changing. I mean, I think if you look back with pre-COVID, one of the biggest societal shifts we've seen was just an absolute intolerance of us continuing to behave irresponsibly environmentally. I mean, the consumer drive for that has been you know, extraordinary. It's happened in quite a short space of time. And I expect all of us have seen that reflected in our workforces as well. So I think whether it's employees, whether it's shareholders, whether it's customers, we are going to find that we're held to account. And so it's a rather cynical way of saying that, you know, we're going to be forced to change. I hope that actually the motivation comes from knowing it's the right thing to do. But I do think it's going to be increasingly difficult to sustain a gap between what you say and what you do in this area. Well, that's great. And actually, um, that's what you both said at the beginning. You both said this is an imperative. We have to change. Um, and the time has come for us to recognize that. Uh, so thank you for sharing with us your views. Thank you for um, all of your points and the questions. Um, thanks to the viewers. And uh, take care and see you this time next week. Thank you. Bye-bye.